we can start. So welcome everybody to the linked open data lessons. Um, today we will, will be dedicated to this argument, the semantic web, and we will try to give you an overview of the main concept behind it, but uh, it's a very tough subject, so we will try to do our best to make something uh, easy to you. So, uh, linked open data is a set of practices which is used uh, to implement uh, the semantic web, web infrastructure. And uh, the semantic web is, in a sense, uh, the evolution of the current web towards uh, what we could call uh, web 3.0, which means uh, essentially going towards uh, a global data representation. And you have already seen that um, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are the pillars of the web. And the HTML in itself is a presentational markup designed to mark the structure of hypertext. And as you know, a hypertext that targets human readers and uh, talk to them about any content. And this was uh, originally web 1.0, which was uh, a web of pure hypertext for humans laid uh, on top of a unique presentation layer. Then you have seen uh, in the past days that there are also other technologies because uh, one issue about uh, this kind of presentation is that content, that is our data, is mingled with presentation, that is our hypertext. And there's only the hypertext talking about some content and not the content itself available independently from any specific presentation. And our presentation, that is our web page, is static and always equal for all the users loading the same page. You have then seen that uh, we can move the content uh, into another layer, which is the representation layer, which uh, handles data models. And uh, we have seen an example of this using semantic markup, that is XML, essentially where content is independent and separate from presentation, which is uh, then generated by software. The software which generates a presentation may be usually XSLT, which is an XML dialect uh, targeted to transform XML into something else, in this case, HTML, but it could be also done using other technologies. At any rate, we are going to take the content and produce a surface presentation based on HTML. Now, a similar separation from, uh, between content and presentation is found in a much wider context, that's uh, the current web, where content usually is in a separate backend, whatever its storage technologies, so they may be XML files, databases, or whatever. And then you have uh, less or more complex software systems which interact with users to get data on behalf of them and present it in real time according to user interaction in a graphical user interface. So we have here a software which fetches data from a backend and presents it generating a HTML-based representation on the presentational layer. And that's essentially our web 2.0, which we may say is uh, essentially a web of applications where presentation is generated from content by software. And in this web, so the only, only the topmost layer of the systems targets humans, that is the presentational layer. And uh, that's uh, much, mu much uh, smarter than before because everything responds uh, to specific users' requests uh, in uh, nearly real time with presentations tailored to their interactions and preferences, like using uh, a, a desktop uh, application. Yet, uh, this is all smarter by virtue of these applications uh, and their data rather than by virtue of the infrastructure itself, that is the web. So the promise of web 3.0, if you want to call it so, the semantic web, which is going to be a web of data, is to bring the separation of content and presentation found already in our current web applications into the web infrastructure itself by providing a global data representation rather than presentation through hypertext. That is, we are going to directly publish data with globally standard models. Thus, 
providing a web of data targeting machines, first of all, and then humans. And that's a sort of worldwide uniformly modeled database where anyone can publish his own data at any time, just like now everyone can publish his own page at any time in the current web. Currently, we are still using, in most cases, uh, search engines, which uh, is a sort of mining data from its text presentation in hypertext in the web. As you can uh, uh, already know, a search engine is like a sort of giant and very smart index to a huge book, and the book here is just a web of hypertexts. And uh, hypertext essentially has a text in a natural language, intended, of course, for human readers, and links to other hypertexts. And a search engine in this context just indexes normalized text and takes into account a number of related factors like incoming links, for instance. But in any case, the human language, by its very nature, is ambiguous, as you know, and there are a number of different human languages across the world. So if I am going to type a word like Homer in a Google search box, what I get is this. That is, I get information about the Greek poet and the Simpsons. And this happens because data in traditional pages is informal and lacks structure. That is, we just have a name, Homer, in the case, in a text, our hypertext, our page. And the machine knows nothing about what's a poet or a cartoon. It just uh, relies on words, even if in a very smart and, power and powerful way. So if we want to, to go towards a global representation, we must somehow structure our data, that is, organize them in a much more formal way. And uh, to this end, Tim Berners-Lee, in 2010, provided uh, a set of deployment requirements for more structured data in the web using a five stars uh, rating system, which I can briefly sketch here. So we get one star when we just put something on the web. When something is available on the web, we get just one star for this. So, for instance, uh, think about uh, a printed sheet of paper with a table on it. And we can take a picture of this, of this uh, sheet and put the JPEG file on the web. Of course, uh, here data is locked inside the document because a human reader can read the image, but uh, a machine not, or at least it's not so easy for it to read. And uh, also a human reader cannot even copy a single digit or a word from this text because uh, it's just an image and the bits here represent a grid of pixels and not uh, some characters of a text. So if we go further in this uh, structuring, we can get two stars if we rather use a, machi a machine readable structured format, like for instance, a spreadsheet like Microsoft Excel in the XLS format. In this case, we effectively unlock the data uh, so that we can use them, for instance, to make calculations or draw charts or whatever. But data is still locked, this time inside the proprietary format, because no one uh, is uh, necessarily, have, uh, necessarily has a, a copy of a Microsoft Excel installed on his own uh, computer. And so, if you want to open our data, we must use some standard format, like, for instance, CSV, thus gaining the third star. CSV is just a, a plain text file, which represents tabular data and uses a line of text to represent each row in the table and separate its columns by using a reserved character, for instance, the comma, whence the name CSV, that is comma separated values. So uh, practically, practically every software can open just a, a plain text like this. And so we have effectively unlocked our data to the public. But the problem here is more subtle because we have unlocked our data, but we have still them on the web rather than inside it. What do I mean with this? Let's make um, a sample. Uh, think, for instance, uh, 
to this uh, scenario. I want uh, to link to a specific row in that spreadsheet table from my own website. And when you are within the limits of that spreadsheet or that file, you can easily identify each record, each row in our case, by maybe just row indexes. So we can say that we have row one, row two, row three, and so forth. But uh, outside the boundaries of these documents, these numbers uh, are meaningless. So in the context of the global web, you can't just use row 12 because it doesn't mean anything outside the boundaries of that spreadsheet. So we would rather have to use something which uniquely identifies each record in our table in the context of the whole, web, of the whole global web. And uh, we can do this just like we currently identify each page in the web now. Now, if we want to identify a web page, we are just typing its address in your browser. This address is known as a URL, Uniform Resource Locator, and it's a subset of a more generic concept, which is known as URI which is, uh, does a way we can use to uniquely identify each row in our table, just like we uniquely identify each page in the web. So what we are going to do to gain four stars is just attaching each, uh, to each row a unique uh, identifier in the form of a URI. And so data comes into the web because it can be linked directly to other data that's forming a sort of giant interconnected graph of data and these linking data gains us five stars which is the top of uh, this pyramid and is uh, the target of the semantic web and linked open data of course in real world we are dealing with huge data which are distributed across a huge number of computers in the internet and uh, currently we have a number of strategies to distribute database data for instance uh, across several servers to better serve it to the public and we can do a sample with some tabular data because that's a popular format and that's easy to grasp it, it introduces us to the world of RDF modeling. So take, for instance, a list of persons, very simple like this, with a column representing a numeric uh, arbitrarily chosen ID for that person, another representing his name, birth date, and birthplace. These columns represent our metadata, that is, they describe the meaning of each cell in a row of data. And then we have our rows, which represent the persons in our list. So we have Marco Polo, Nicolo Polo, Matteo Polo, etc. Now, if we are going to distribute this data across several machines in the web, a first strategy is splitting the table horizontally, that is, distribute by rows. So we will have a server containing some Set, subset of the rows of the table and another server containing another subset of the rows and so forth. In this case, we are going to duplicate the metadata, that is the column definitions, because of course each server needs to know that column one is the ID, column two is the name and so forth. Another strategy is the opposite, that is uh, splitting the table uh, vertically and distribute by columns. In this case, we will have a number of columns of the original table in one server and another set of columns into another server. And in this case, we are going to share the IDs because we need to link the columns across different servers to the same row, which represents the same person. So here you can see that, uh, for instance, uh, for Marco Polo, both the servers have the ID 156, which uniquely identifies Marco Polo in both the servers, so that we can connect all the columns to the same person. A third way of distributing 
is the most atomic one and is doing both. That is distributed by both columns and rows, that is by cells, which is the intersection between columns and rows. So we will have some single cells stored in a server and some other cells stored into another server. And this time we will need to share both the columns and the IDs to get this information together. So this is the most atomic data distribution scenario. And that's right, the approach taken by the semantic web using a statement-like construct known as tripole. And the tripole is at the core of the modeling in semantic web using a technology known as uh, RDF, that is Resource Description Framework. So modeling data in RDF is based on tripoles, and tripoles are a sort of linguistic metaphor represented by a very simple English language statement composed by a subject, which in our example is just 156, which is the identifier of the row which represents Marco Polo as a person. And that's the row. Then we have a predicate, which is the property we are talking about with reference to the subject. And in this case, it's the column name. And finally, we have the object, which is the value of uh, the intersection between the row and the column that is our cell, that is Marco Polo. So putting all these together means that we build this statement, that is the person <coughs> identified by 156, which is the subject, has name, and that's the predicate, Marco Polo, and that's the object. So any subject, predicate, and object is globally identified by its own URI, as we have already seen, unless it's a literal, that is a primitive value like, for instance, just a number or a name. And as we have just seen, the fact that uh, each of these parts is identified by a URI doesn't mean that it has to point to an existing page. The URI here is just used as a mean of uniquely identify each concept in our tripoles. Instead, the literals usually have their own data type. That is, we are going to say that, for instance, uh, it's a string that is a simple text, or a number, a date, or whatever. <clears throat> So to make a concrete sample, in DBpedia, which is a sort of a semantic web version of Wikipedia, the URI identifying Marco Polo is the one you see here in orange, that is dbpedia.org resource Marco Polo. And that's the subject of our tripod. We can say about Marco Polo that uh, he has a label that is uh, something which gets attached to the subject to give it a label, in this case a name, seeing that it's a person. And uh, the label concept, which is the predicate, is identified by this other URI, which is uh, w3.org, etc., up to label. Finally, we have the value, the object, which is just a literal in this case, because it's just a name, but a name has a language. So in this case, the at it used as a suffix means that the language of this string is Italian. So what we are saying with this triple composed by a subject, a predicate and an object is that Marco Polo has name Marco Polo, the thing we know as Marco Polo has named Marco Polo at least in Italian, maybe in other languages it would be called with different names. So here any data is expressed by tripoles because that's the modeling system at the core of the web. So we have, for instance, Marco Polo, which is our subject, who has father, and that's another predicate, Niccolo Polo, and that's another object, or he has birth date, and that's another predicate, 1254, 
and this time is an object, but it's a literal object because it's just the year of birth. On or has birthplace, and that's another predicate, Venice, and that's another object, and so forth. So whatever we want to tell about something is expressed in this form of tripod, of simple statements. So this implies that we must have some vocabularies which define all the parts of the top of the tripods, the subjects, the predicate, and the objects. All the resources used as subjects, as predicates, and objects, each with its own URI which identifies it. And so we have a, really a word of vocabularies in the semantic web, and you can have a sketch about them at this website. And there are several vocabularies used to build the so-called ontologies. Ontologies are just a set of concepts and their relations. And we have a number of general purpose uh, vocabularies, like, for instance, Dublin Core, which is a popular format to express metadata, like title, description, creator, date, uh, etc. Or some other vocabularies are more concept specific. So, for instance, there is fourth friend of a friend, <coughs> which is about persons and their activities and relations. Or Wikipedia, which is the semantic version of Wikipedia. Or schema.org, which is maintained by the major search engines and uh, uses some general purpose metadata to annotate websites. And there are a lot of many other vocabularies, but the concept it is that anyone can create his own vocabulary. Yet, of course, trying to reuse concepts for, from other existing vocabularies as far as it is possible, because we are not going to reinvent the wheel every time we must do something on the semantic web. So here, publishing data on the web becomes a slightly different process than before. In our traditional web, one or two, we are publishing data essentially on the presentation radio, however it gets generated, as hypertext or as graphical user interfaces for human <coughs> users. So there's someone who directly publishes some HTML pages or uses some software system to generate them on request. But at any rate, anyone can publish pages in a site and pages get hyperlinked to other pages. And each page is uniquely identified by the so-called URL, <coughs> that is their address in a sense. In our semantic web instead, publishing data, publishing means publishing data representations as tripods for machines consumption. So we have a cloud of tripods already published by other subjects. And when we publish our own ontology, this means that we are publicly using some uh, vocabularies already found in the log cloud to provide our own ontology and merge it with the rest of this giant database which gets uh, composed in real time. So here, anyone can publish data as tripods, which get merged into the global data graph. And concepts here, no more pages, but concepts, are identified by URI, which is the corresponding identifier to the, the identifier corresponding to URL for pages. So here, as you can see, we are going to publish data in a sort of global database rather than pages in a web of hypertext. We have a number of assumptions to be made for this global database. The first is that is known as the triple A slogan and is valid for the current web too. That is, anyone can say anything about any topic because information in the web is born distributed and can be even nonsensical or inconsistent because I'm totally free to publish a web page where I say that the art is flat or the moon is made of cheese and I'm completely free to do this. And that's the, <clears throat> the consequence of the freedom of the democratic web in a sense. 
So we may have an ontology which uh, tells us with just a single triple that Marco Polo has as a father, Niccolò Polo. And here again, you can see a subject, a predicate and an object. And another ontology published by someone else who tells us that Marco Polo has as a father, Maffeo Polo. And so we have, we have a contradiction because uh, Marco Polo cannot have two biological fathers. But that's a fact, and that's part of the game of the web. Another fact, another assumption, is the open world assumption, that is, information in any given moment is just a snapshot of what is available at that moment. So we can rely on assuming that our information is ever complete, because, to repeat the previous sample, if we have our first ontology, which tells us about Marco Polo's father, but uh, for any reason, in this moment, the other server is down, we will have no contradiction, because we just have a single source of data. And uh, given that that's a web of interconnected data, you can't be assured that in any moment, you have all the available information, because at any given moment, new information can pop up and be merged into the global database or may disappear. Finally, we have the new unique naming assumption that is given that there is no central authority to manage the IDs assigned to things, the same thing can get any number of IDs because as you have seen, IDs are just URI and everyone with a domain, that is everyone who can, who can publish a website, can create new URIs. So it's perfectly possible that some ontology uses his own, its own URI for Marco Polo and some other ontology uses another kind of URI. Later, we will uh, be able to merge them, that is to say that uh, we can say that one URI is equivalent to another one. But in principle, anyone can forge any number of IDs for any concept. So let's see some, a sample graph of triples to see something more practical about Marco Polo for what we can find in DBpedia. Marco Polo in DBpedia is identified by this URI and we can say about him that he has a name Marco Polo in Italian or Polo Marco in Russian and then that he is a person and person here is a concept taken from the fourth vocabulary, which identifies a person and has its own URI. And then he was born in 1254, and here we have a literal. And he was born in some place whose URI is this one. And this place has name Venice in Italian or Fenedig in German. And also he was an explorer of Asia. So, as you can see, everything is a triple, and each part in it has its own URI, except, of course, for literals. Of course, URI are verbose, and so we can try to shorten them by replacing the first portion with uh, an arbitrarily chosen prefix. And in this way, we are creating something which is known as qualified name, or just cuname, which is a pair built of a prefix and a name. So, for instance, we can mint a DBR prefix for that part of the URI and just use DBR colon Marco Polo, which is much shorter than before. And this holds for all the other things in this graph. So, for RDFS, which is another vocabulary, and RDF, which is the core vocabulary of RDF, FOAF, which is the friend of a friend vocabulary, and other vocabularies from DBpedia ontologies. So, what I want to emphasize here is that the power of linking data, that is the value of the network in, the, in this case, is greater than the sum of its parts, because the power of the semantic web is right on the connection between data. That's uh, the name itself which tells us it, linked open data. So we can see also remaining in, within the boundaries of a single ontology like DBpedia that starting from a single node in this graph, we can jump across nodes up to even remotely connected things 
may be derived even from different ontologies, but all merged into the same global data graph. So for instance, here at Marco Polo is uh, an explorer of Asia, and another explorer of Asia in the same ontology is Ferdinando Magellano. So we can jump from one person to another. Or Venice, which is the birthplace of Marco Polo, is also the city which is nearest to the Venetian Lagoon, and the Venetian Lagoon is another concept found in the Wikipedia. Or Venice is the death place of a rather obscure Italian painteress of the 17th century known as Giulia Lama. And this is another thing found in the Wikipedia. Or even more farther, Anthony Quinn is an actor, and uh, as far as I know, has nothing to do with Marco Polo, except the fact that both are persons. So through the person node, I can jump to any other person in this ontology. Or the farthest, the farthest example so far, we can jump from Marco Polo to Alpi Eagles, which is uh, um, an out of business uh, airline Italian company which had as its hub airport Venice, and Venice is the birthplace of Marco Polo. So you can see how we can jump across all the nodes and get to every concept which is inside this kind of graph. And you must think this as a global graph. We are not going only inside the Wikipedia, but inside every ontology which gets published in the Lord Cloud. So that's a very powerful thing and really a huge global wide database. Of course, this data must be somehow stored, which means serializing them. And because RDF is an abstract data model, we need to have some serialization format to store its tripods. And there are several of them targeted at different scenarios. And for our purpose, we are just going to see Turtle, which is the easiest to be understood by humans and uh, is just based on text. In Turtle, we just have a text where URIs are wrapped into angle brackets and the two names, that is a prefix with a name, are expressed <coughs> using a preamble which defines each of them with this syntax. So for instance, you can see an example here where you have a number of prefixes, three prefixes. Each one is defined, RDF, FOAF, and DBR with its own URI. And then we have a tripole expressed uh, in Turtle, where we have a subject, Marco Polo, a predicate type, and an object, person. And uh, it says the usual thing, that is that Marco Polo is a person. We have literals also, which are wrapped into quotes, and we may optionally make them be followed by their type uh, with the syntax. So, for instance, we are saying that uh, 100 to uh, 1 to 3 is a, an integer number, or that this other value is a date. And also, we use an abbreviation for this uh, rather commonly used uh, predicate, that is RDF type, which tells us that something belongs to a specific type, that is Marco Polo belongs to the classes of person, the class of persons. And so we can abbreviate RDF type with just A, that is to say Marco Polo is a person. <clears throat> As for statements, all the statements are ended by full stop, and when we have multiple statements about the same subject, they, call, they all can be <clears throat> ended by a semicolon except the last. And the same holds uh, when we are sharing the subject and predicate, in this case, using the comma. So, in this instance, uh, you have Marco Polo, which is the subject. And then we have three tripods about Marco Polo, which all share the same subject. So we are just using a semicolon to delimit each, sub, each uh, tripod and uh, the full stop when we are at the end of the document. So we also have another uh, peculiarity of RDF, which is blank nodes, which is reflected in serialization and also in Cartel, which is uh, about nodes without an identity. That the, these nodes are used to express the fact that we know something about something, but uh, not its identity. For instance, that someone wrote this post. 
and uh, a blank node may be used as a subject. So like in this case, there is an otherwise unknown person named Ted or as an object. For instance, Marco Polo had a mistress and we don't know anything else about her. So if we go to see a complete startled sample, this is the text which represents our nodes graph we have sampled until now. As you can see, we have a subject and predicate and object, and we are representing the subject, which is Marco Polo. A first couple of triples, which tells us that he has two labels. He's a person, he has a birth date and a birthplace, and then he's an explorer of Asia, and uh, something about Venice, which has a couple of labels. So that's a way um, in which we can express our graph in a textual format. So that's enough for this theoric introduction. And uh, in this next section, the laboratory, we will see some more uh, practical examples about this kind of stuff. For the moment, if you have any questions, you are free to ask them, or you can uh, then uh, discuss more in the lab for who is going to attend it. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, Daniele, if I may, um, thank you very much for this uh, very, very interesting talk. And uh, I'd like to play the devil's advocate. How, um, how does this extremely complex uh, way of encoding information relate of data and its connections relate to actual computing power? Because the, the, the quantity of data in the world is enormous. And um, is this actually feasible with current computing resources? to encode data at our disposal in this way? Yeah, uh, that's a point. And uh, effectively, you have seen just the RDF, RDF, which is the core of the semantic modeling. But uh, there are also another kind uh, of layers we will see in the afternoon, maybe, which uh, provide even more complexities because they define taxonomies, relationships, constraints. And so we can get up to a point uh, where it is simply impossible for all the computing power in the world to use this kind of information. So we must be wise and uh, just uh, encode what we are going to use. That is, we are just uh, represent a model what we are going to use. So for instance, uh, from whatever project, usually the process is uh, creating a database with every detail we may imagine, and then extract from the database a subset in the form of triples and publish them so that uh, everyone can get attached to the same graph. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Mi scusi, io conosco bene l'inglese, ma non parlo ma non parlo l'inglese studio e do gli ottimi risultati per quando sono io sono una linguista computazionale. Eh, mi interesso di tecniche linguistiche eh, di produzione. Faccio una domanda a lei, è stato meraviglioso perché io sono stata tra le prime a partecipare al Semantic Web con il polo di SN di Annibale Lia e Maurizio Gross. Perché Chiedo a lei, c'è questo divario, divario tra l'analista computazionale no? che si chiude nel suo uh, isolamento tecnico di procedere ad analisi, analisi manipolative. Non sarebbe molto più semplice agganciarsi a tutto quello che ha detto lei prima di formalizzare i dati, cioè di creare delle tecniche linguistiche computazionali che si aggregano alle tecniche cloud per avere dei risultati comuni. L'analisi trasformazionale probabilistica non serve a nessuno, perché noi esseri umani nella comunicazione siamo unici e identici. Anche lei nella sua presentazione ha dato una modalità esecutiva delle tecniche di produzione, di formalizzazione eh, di nodi, di metadata, meravigliosa, perché ognuno di noi è single, chiaro? Mm -hmm. Perché lei c'è cioè, questa forma, non esiste un blended tra le tecniche linguistiche di produzione e di analisi, delle, io lo chiamo humanitas littere, 
proprio in questo campo, oppure digital public, che sono i linguaggi, sono i linguaggi di comunicazione. Chiaro? Okay. Perché non esiste? Uh, it's so difficult to respond, but uh, it's a complex question because it implies, first of all, some technologies which are already in place. That is, um, if you go uh, in some uh, web pages which are using load as a backend engine for providing data, you can find that they often provide uh, a sort of natural language query uh, processing, so that you just type in natural language what you want to get that is, uh, tell me uh, about all the person who were born uh, in Venice. Mm -hmm. And then this is transformed by natural language processing into a Sparkle query. And Sparkle is the query language for this kind of data. And then it gets executed and you get the results. But uh, these are pioneeristic uh, techniques at the moment because, of course, natural language processing is a difficult field in itself, and uh, we have to convert uh, the representations into a set of tripods to be understood. But uh, that's a fact, and, this, and the research is going towards this uh, end of uh, having a sort of a natural way of querying data in this global data model. The other fact is rooted uh, on the DH itself, the digital humanist itself, that is, um, we have difficulty to merge fields which have been uh, often taught in separate uh, contexts. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe just the scholars keep uh, reasoning in uh, more paper related terms, that is, in terms uh, which do not uh, conceive uh, the presentation as separate from the representation. And so they have in mind uh, something which is an addition, which gets printed or displayed on the screen, which is something instead which is a byproduct of a much more structured data, which is also much more star abstract. So we must teach humanists to think in a different way. And that's difficult because we have centuries of tradition in this field. But we are going to, to do this, and we hope to do something as digital humanists ourselves. Grazie. Grazie, grazie. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are just out of our time, so I think if you have a, another question, you should post uh, on the web or on the, by email or just ask in the, in the lab session or in the afternoon session because the afternoon session will be also targeted to what you are willing to know about uh, this kind of very complex topic. So we are going to give you more information about further layers or just have a more hands-on practice on something. You will decide and we will act accordingly. So now we make a... Um, an interval of 10 minutes and then we will see our uh, with the lab people on the private room for the rest thank you all <clears throat>